Um, so I want to talk today about some work I've been doing over the past couple of years in modeling paraphrase, and then more recently, the direction, one possible direction that you can take this, which is uh, models for conditional or controlled generation. So more on that later. Uh, but to step back um, at the start, uh, oh, and I should mention this is joint work with a bunch of folks that you know because they were here. In fact, some of this work that I'll talk about was, was done here. So uh, some of you know it quite well. Uh, most of the work was done by my PhD student, John Whiting, um, over the past few years. And then more recently, folks like Moeth and uh, Jonathan and Luke who were here, as well as uh, a U Chicago student, um, Yuan Jia Pang. OK, so uh, my goal, what I want to do, is develop systems that understand language, text, the same way a person does. So I'm not necessarily interested in superhuman performance, but I actually care about understanding how people write text for other people. And I think systems, if we want to understand what people mean when they write, I think our system should try to understand it the way a person does. And one uh, step uh, in that, uh, that direction is to work on tasks. So the task that I'm going to talk about today uh, for the first half of the talk is the one of, do two sentences have the same meaning? And so there are lots of ways to think about this task. I think one way to think about its value is, well, we know that semantics is hard. There's a lot of work on developing representations for the semantics of a sentence. And so rather than think about what that should look like and how to annotate um, sentences for it, maybe we can sort of push the problem into how people annotate similarity of sentences. And if we have a representation of a sentence that correlates with human judgments, maybe this means that we're getting uh, one step in the direction of having a representation that captures the, uh, the um, sentential semantics. So uh, to be concrete, uh, we focused on this task, the sum of semantic textual similarity, or STS tasks. And I want to start by showing a few examples from the data sets that we're all on the same page of what this can do, what it can't do. So the annotation by humans, given a pair of sentences, like other ways are needed and we must find other ways, uh, the output is a similarity score from 0 to 5. So these two are quite similar in meaning, high similarity score of 4.4. 4. Uh, 4. 4. So but consider a pair like this. Uh, these sentences are about the same thread of news stories. But they're actually about different things. There are different agents, and there are different, uh, there's, are different predicates in these two sentences. So the similarity score is a bit lower, 2.6, so kind of about midway. Then if you look at an example of uh, something like a contradiction, so two people expressing opposite beliefs about the same kind of thing, um, this is a much lower similarity score, although still not zero, because they are talking about the same sort of thing. Uh, whereas sentences that are unrelated, like a plane flying in the distance, the one with a white horse, these have zero similarity, so they're just unrelated. Uh, we could definitely quibble with maybe we want to use more than one axis, maybe we should handle contradiction uh, differently, but this is at least what we have data for, and this is still a very challenging task, even though it's just a single axis of similarity that we're considering. So we're going to focus on, as our test set, the STS data from 2012 to 2016, which is nice because it has a, a lot of different domains. Um, sentence lengths vary a lot. Some are very challenging, glosses from dictionaries. Um, others are uh, simple language captions. But this is a good stress test for general purpose sentence similarity modeling. So most uh, systems for this task focus on modeling the pair of sentences jointly, trying to align parts of one sentence with the other. Uh, we are going to use a much simpler approach, I would argue, and also more constrained. So we're just going to learn an embedding function for each of the sentences. Similarity is the cosine similarity of the embeddings. So this means the only learnable parameters are in the embedding function g. So uh, there's been a lot of work on learning sentence embeddings. Our goal is to learn them such that sentences with the same meaning are close in the embedded space. So there are, there are lots of ways where this might be potentially useful. So imagine, uh, for example, you're trying to summarize maybe multiple documents, create a single summary. You want to figure out when the same, uh, the same fact is mentioned across multiple documents. When you're generating the summary, you want to figure out if you've already kind of mentioned that same fact, maybe in a different way, in, in, a, in a paraphrased form. As another example for, for uh, MT, um, you may want to train with a, with a more informed metric rather than just cross entropy over predicting the next word. We can use our sentence similarity models to give us more signal during training 
and with the evaluation. This is something that we're, we're currently working on. I don't have enough results to talk about it yet today, but uh, hopefully we'll have something next year. So we're now going to talk about um, some work we've been doing over the past few years. We've done a lot of work in developing good data sets for training these models, variations of loss functions, as well as uh, comparing compositional architectures. Today I'm really just going to kind of give some summaries and some highlights uh, that kind of give a sense of where we are today. So uh, data does tend to be, uh, at least in our, uh, in our results, data seems to be the most important factor of these three. So we started out working with the Paraphrase database. Um, this is a well-known resource uh, developed about five or six years ago. Um, and so the way it works, uh, it actually goes back to many years uh, prior to that, Chris Kelts and Birch's thesis, if you have uh, you have parallel text in two languages. You can pivot over, say, the non-English language and figure out that imprisoned is a paraphrase of thrown into jail. And you do this at scale across hundreds of millions of uh, sentence pairs. And you can find things that tend to, uh, to appear many times. And you end up with this data set of hundreds of millions of phrase pairs like this. Some of these are sentences, like the third example. But many of them are phrases of varying lengths. So it's, uh, we found a lot of benefit, as well as, as others have found a lot of benefit, by using this, this data set for learning word embeddings. But for sentences, it's more mixed. And so we'll, we'll see that in our results later. So this is huge, and it's free. Um, but it's phrase pairs. So that set us into looking for other data sources of sentence pairs that would be close to the paraphrase relationship. So the first one that we stumbled upon is the simple English to standard English Wikipedia data set. So there have been a couple of versions developed mainly for simplification. Uh, we use the version from Coaster and, and uh, uh, Kojic from 2011, uh, which has about 200,000 sentence pairs. And we're going to just treat it as a set of paraphrases. These are just a couple examples showing the kinds of things that are in this data set. The first example is a I think this is a nice case where there is a very local, uh, specific paraphrase. Um, but the second example shows how sometimes one sentence has more information or less information than the other due to the nature of how uh, the Wikipedians uh, generate the data. And so it's not, they're certainly not perfect paraphrases. So this contains uh, sentence pairs, which is better than the paraphrase database, but only 200,000 of them. So um, at the time we were working on this, we were trying to figure out other data sources. In the, in the past year or so, there has been some nice work by, uh, by some folks like Wei Xu and her students at OSU. They're using tweets and um, parallel tweets with the same links to, to find paraphrase pairs. We haven't started uh, playing with that data, but I think that's a promising source. Um, what we are going to be talking about today is um, work we, we did to generate data using NeuralMT. So people don't naturally write paraphrases. Um, it's not something that really exists in the world, at least not at scale. But they do naturally translate. So if you're looking for natural annotation of something, if you can mine by text for it, that's going to be fruitful. So we're going to focus on the CZ Ang uh, 1.6 parallel corpus, which is over 50 million Czech English sentence pairs. Uh, it's mostly subtitles from film and TV, but a wide variety of other domains. And even though there's only 2% medical, that's still, hey, 1 million sentence pairs. So um, nothing to slouch at. So our, our approach is very simple. We take sentence pairs, Czech and English, from the parallel corpus run a neural MT system, check to English on the check side, and then pair the English reference and the translation. Uh, we use the pre-trained check English model from the Nematis uh, uh, toolkit for this, which is a, a pretty strong check English model. So these are some examples from the data set. In each pair, one of these is a reference translation of a check sentence. The other is a neural MT output from a check sentence. And it's the same ordering in every pair. Anyone have a guess for which one is the neural MT output, first or second? Second. Huh, what makes you say that, Lily? 
Yeah, well, it is shorter, at least in number of characters in all cases. And neural the output tends to be shorter, um, simpler, use kind of more canonical words. Any other? Yeah, one person mentioned, uh, I don't think that a person would write a help message saying, your computer is already installing or removing Active Directory. It's usually in the passive. So it's more likely that uh, the actual references, Active Directory is already being installed. Um, but neural MT systems like to use more canonical sentence structures is what we found. And so um, they're going to probably tend to use active voice, at least when, um, when that's common for the words involved. So from these examples, um, it looks pretty promising. Uh, of course, there is some noise. So we, uh, we analyzed a set of about 500 of these from different levels of similarity score and uh, find that about more than two thirds are pretty strong paraphrase pairs and more than half are very strong pairs. Um, and, and we can use uh, very simple models to filter out the ones that are not equivalent. So we, we still get uh, tens of millions that are pretty good quality. And the, the fluency is, is quite good, as you would expect from, uh, from neural MT output, uh, especially when run on its own data and especially on uh, subtitles, which tend to be short. So we're going to compare these three data sets. I haven't told you about training or models, but we'll see that in a bit. But for now, just one quick set of experiments. Uh, we compared these three, a same size sample from each in terms of number of words. And the para and MT data set um, is doing at least as well as the, the simple wiki um, data set. And, and they're both uh, much better than the paraphrase database. For words, the paraphrase database is great, and for phrases. But for sentences, it is not as good as these um, sentence level data sets. Uh, yes, this is the Pearson correlation across uh, one of the STS uh, data sets. So, so the correlation is between cosine similarity from our sentence embeddings and the human annotation. Yeah. And I'll say more now about training and models and uh, uh, data sets that we use uh, for tuning and for testing. OK, so um, that's mostly all I want to say about um, data sets. And now we need training objectives such that we can learn the parameters of the embedding function g from those paraphrastic sentence pairs. So this is a little bit different from a traditional supervised learning setting. For one thing, we don't have any negative examples. We just have these positive examples of sentence pairs that are paraphrases. We also we do not assume any similarity annotations of the nature of those scores that I showed you on the third slide, where we have. Uh, uh, the 4.4 and so on and so forth. We only use that a small amount of that data for tuning, but we don't train on any of that data. So uh, we're going to use a contrastive hinge loss with negative sampling, with a, a particular form of the negative sampling. So uh, our loss is a sum over paraphrase pairs from para and MT. And we want to make the cosine similarity of the observed pair UV higher than the cosine similarity of U with a given negative example T. And we choose those uh, by finding the most similar sentence to you in the current mini batch. So just doing the argmax using our same model cosine similarity uh, with our embedding function g. Uh, and we started doing this only over the current mini batch because it's a lot faster than doing it over the whole data set. Um, but it also tends to work better. If you do the argmax over the whole data set, you're much more likely to find a negative example that's actually a paraphrase. There are lots of possible paraphrases for any given input. Um, so this, this is what we did for words, and it worked really well. We actually found that when we moved to sentences, we had to do the negative sampling over a larger set. So we call it a mega batch, a union of M mini batches where we tune M. So we still do parameter updates after every mini batch. But for choosing our negative examples, we choose from a larger set, which we call a mega batch. And we can look at the, uh, so uh, the original here is u. And then each row shows for a different mega batch size the negative example that it's chosen during training, after training has, has been going for, for a bit. So as we increase the size of the mega batch, we get a negative example that is closer to the, uh, the original sentence u. And I think here's just one more example. In the space of sentences, it's very difficult to expect a near paraphrase to occur 
in a batch of size 100 or 500. So having a couple thousand or tens of thousands of these really helps us find much more reasonable negative examples. And it's still much faster than, of course, using the whole data set, which would probably also suffer from issues of uh, being too similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, if I could plot it, it would probably be kind of, uh, dimini yeah, like probably uh, diminishing returns um, as you increase M. So we, we do find that 20 and 40 are, are similar. So training on para and MT, I haven't, uh, actually this is averaging over all of our model types. Uh, there's a difference between one and either 20 or 40, but not much difference between 20 and 40. Um, but we did find a consistent difference between going above one. So something maybe to keep in mind if you're going to be doing similar kind of training on noisy positive examples. So M is the number of mini batches or the number of sentences in the mega batch? Number of mini batches, okay. which varied based on the setting. It was usually from 100 to 500. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I want to say about loss functions. Any other questions about that? before we move on to models. Okay, great. So we've also done a lot of work over the years on comparing neural network architectures for the, the G function uh, to, to convert a sentence into a vector. So um, we found strong performance with the simple baseline of just averaging word vectors. So here the only parameters are the embeddings for the words, and we just stick to the averaging composition function. We've also found strong results by using character trigrams and averaging their embeddings across the sentence. So we keep the spaces in here, which does actually, the model does actually use a little bit of the um, kind of presence of multiple words here. We do notice some kind of systematic things with regard to having a, a T at the end of the previous word, then a space, and then, uh, because that's often uh, correlated with the word not. So the model it is uh, using some of these kind of crossword uh, trigrams, even though they're just trigrams of characters. We've, we've kind of played around with this with different orders of n-grams. Uh, trigrams are a nice middle ground. Uh, bigrams are too short. If you go up to four grams, five grams, that can, it's a lot of parameters and they're rare, so it starts to get harder to learn. You tend to overfit a little bit more. Uh, trigram is a nice small model, relatively concise, and seems to generalize quite well. So um, it's a nice thing to um, if you don't want to run a, a character CNN or a character by LSTM, um, adding up the or a, averaging the character trigrams can be a reasonable, um, quick thing to try out. And of course, we use a standard LSTM. We just use a forward LSTM. We get found similar results with uh, with a by LSTM, and we average the the hidden vectors over all the words. So um, we've also done some development of some other architectures that. Uh, that combine different aspects of these. But for this comparison, we found the model did not matter all that much. So this is our uh, comparison um, across several STS uh, test sets of these three model types when training on para-NMT. Um, but they do seem to be picking up different things. So if we use models that simply concatenate, uh, so it's still kind of a single training run, but the model is now concatenation of word averaging and character trigram averaging, as in the word comma trigram model, uh, then we do uh, find stronger correlations than um, just using the individual models. And we're going to focus on this word trigram model for the rest of our experiments. Um, so I talked about data, loss functions, models. Now I'll give some more results. So for training, we did most of our experiments just training on five million sentence pairs from para and MT. This was mainly for computational reasons. We did a couple experiments with 10 million and saw some gains with that. So I expect that if we could continue scaling it up, we would uh, probably see more gains by using more data. For tuning, all we use is this tiny data set from STS 2017 with 250 sentence pairs. And then for testing, um, I'll give results across 2012 to 2016. Um, we'll compare it to two sets of uh, systems. The first is um, other work in developing sentence embeddings. So uh, there's a lot of work out there. There are a lot of different ways uh, to evaluate sentence embeddings. Um, we've been focusing on the STS tasks 
Um, these other methods like InferSent, Glove, Sensivec, they've been focusing on this task as well as lots of others. And so this kind of, and so they, they tend to use either unlabeled data or differently labeled data. So uh, the InferSent model uses the SNLI data set for, for training. This kind of gives a sense of the benefit that you can get by training on a data set that is designed for paraphrase, so a set of, of these noisy paraphrase pairs. Um, we can compare our model to, these are the, from the STS competitions at some eval each year. Uh, each year it's a different system, but we're just plotting the best system in yellow for each year. And our single model is able to do better than all of these. Uh, I think this is promising because most of those systems used annotations. They train to match the human similarity score. Uh, they use WordNet or other resources typically. They typically do joint modeling of the sentence pair, which we have not not done at all. So I think there's a lot of room to maybe push these results higher by using some of those methods if the STS task is what we really care about. We've been kind of more interested in having the sentence embedding bottleneck because that seems more useful generally. Um, but if you cared about this for some of the applications I mentioned earlier, like MT or summarization, then you might want to uh, try to use some of these methods, which I expect would probably improve the results. Any other questions so far? Yes. Yeah, we've we've tried that in some in, in some past work. Yeah. Um, yeah, BP. Um, yeah, so we've we've done some things with that, and BPE can work quite well. So um, yeah, since this paper, we've uh, so uh, I will come back to your question in a minute, but just uh, on the BP thing, we've kind of done the same thing, but kind of replacing word averaging with the BP averaging, and the results are comparable to word averaging. Yeah, so it so that does seem to be, and maybe a little bit better. Um, so that, yeah, that seems promising. Um, as far as using higher order engrams, we didn't kind of do those in this setting. I think, I think it probably would help, yeah. So we, we found that in, in prior work that if we're careful about the higher order engrams that we use, and then that, that can be helpful, especially in cases where words are really important. So for these STS tasks, words are important, but not as important as they should be. Um, we've tried a little bit of that. Um, so max pooling, say, the sequence of hidden vectors for the LSTM or things like that, yeah. Um, so we found averaging to work better, um, although it's not a, actually for the sentence classification tasks, we found max pooling to be better, but for the STS tasks, generally averaging was better. Which I think kind of makes sense. Um, you know, these are not huge differences we're talking about, but uh, I think if you're focused on the classification tasks and with the uh, the InferSent model, they use max pooling, and that seems uh, to be better for them. Uh, and they do really well in the classification data. So I think if, if that's your goal, and then uh, max pooling makes sense. If you're trying to do similarity of, of two representations, and then it seems like averaging is, is better. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. You think that the competition function can be fast and dependent on that? Um, So I would say no. Um, I think it's, uh, well, it's probably too early to, to say. I think right now the answer is no, because we don't have one that works for everything. Uh, I think it's interesting to look at all the work on the sent eval uh, framework for evaluating sentence embeddings. And there is no single model or representation that works for all tasks. Some work for some and not for others. And um, so the byte m lstm from radford et al does best on the sentiment task because it's trained on sentiment like data um, and then uh, the infrasent is better on, on certain things and skip thought is really good on certain things um, so currently um, it seems like every time people are trying to get a single representation that works well on everything um, it has not been able to beat all the other things on everything which is probably a tall order um, so uh, i think you're probably always going to get a little bit better results if you focus on a particular task that's just kind of what we see generally. Um, but of course, it would be nice to not have to do that. So I mean, that's the goal, is to have something like, like Elmo and sentence embeddings that we can just use for everything, right? Um, so I think uh, 
currently we're not close enough that still if you do things that are particular for the task, that can always still give you a significant gain. Maybe not life changing, but significant. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, so during my PhD I did some work on phrase uh, dependency grammars because, you know, phrases are really valuable for MT, but you kind of want to model some kind of like kind of high level structure on the phrases. Maybe that's a reasonable model for, for the semantics of a sentence. Um, I, think, uh, I think that could be interesting. Um, one way to, to think about that could be, well, if you can maybe do bipart encoding across multiple words, you can kind of figure out which things are sticky or combine it with some simple kind of PMI measures to kind of figure out which things should be segmented, which shouldn't, and then have a composition function that uses that kind of structure. We haven't really experimented with much along those lines. We're, we're working a little bit on BBE across words. Um, yeah, we weren't able to get a lot of great results with that, but. Of the training or the testing? Um, yeah, so training, we actually limited, for para NMT, we limited to sentences max 30 words. Um, I think this, this tended to help because the neural NT output got more noisy for longer sentences. Although for, say, for the simple English data set, we did not have to limit it. Um, we got very little benefit by limiting sentence length compared to the neural NT output uh, data set. So I think that's probably due to uh, either issues with uh, the, the neural um, uh, systems for long sentences or issues with characteristics of that data set. So the, the subtitles tend to be short and maybe are easier to learn from. The, the longer sentences tend to be other domains and maybe are just harder to learn from or not as useful for the STS tasks. And the STS lengths uh, vary from, you know, 5 to 50 tokens, but I think most of them are below 30. I think they also tend to be relatively short. I think for long sentences, STS doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think it's just really hard to annotate right. when you have complex sentences. Yeah, and in paraphrase database, the average size would be around 15. Oh, paraphrase database, um, average is probably around four. Oh. Um, yeah, almost all of them are less than eight oh, okay. for each side, yeah. So the, some of the samples that I showed are, um, yeah, about as long as you see, at least in the high confidence ones. Trying to get a sense of how the correlation uh, con co translates into real decisions. So, um, if you were to threshold and say two sentences that either are or are not saying the same thing, what percentage skew would your system get in the cost factor? So, I guess we could look at a data set that has these binary annotations like the MSR, paraphrase, corpus, and look at. Um, choose a threat or kind of find the optimal threshold and see what that would give us. Do you have a feel of what the ball are? Are you getting like 95% rise or is it like 50%? Um, I don't think it's, so for the MSR data set, um, it's certainly not 95. I, I think we do fine, but not state of the art um, since, you know, uh, serial models would train on it. Um, and that, so I, I think it depends a lot on what is the, what are the negative samples because yeah, yeah. In, in the test set. Because, uh, so the MSR paraphrase data set is the way that they chose their non-paraphrase uh, non pairs was through uh, you know, trying to find very difficult examples that had a, like a lot of word overlap. And so that means that it's a very challenging data set for a model that's trained on just kind of general paraphrases. So all the things that do well on that, as far as I know, train on that data or at least kind of do some tuning on it. Um, so I, but I think that's a good question more generally, you know, beyond just a particular data set. What should, yeah, what should we, tell practitioners if they want to use our similarity scores. Um, what is the kind of distribution that we see in practice and what is a, a safe number? I, yeah, I don't have the answer, but I, I think we should work on that. Okay, great. So um, I want to talk about 
some work we've done then using this power NMT data set for some other generation tasks. And then um, I'll go through these uh, different kind of approaches relatively quickly and then uh, we'll still have time for discussion at the end. So the first thing we, uh, the, it's not actually the first thing we tried, but the first thing that I want to talk about is just what happens if you train a neural MT system on these pairs from power NMT and run it. Well, it oftentimes reproduces the input, but sometimes it does some things that are a little bit interesting. These are two examples where we used inputs that I think they were from a sentiment data set that tends to have noisier inputs. And it appears to be doing something like generating a paraphrase that is a little bit more fluent, maybe using more canonical words or a sentence structure. So I think this is interesting. We haven't actually tried to evaluate this for error correction or for normalization of conversational text, but I think it could be a promising resource for those applications because it has a good sense of what it means to change words while preserving the meaning. Uh, I was hoping that we could just kind of use this as another pre-processing step for all of our NLP, you know, like tokenization. We could just kind of canonicalize everything. Um, but for longer sentences, it does tend to drop some content. And you see kind of bits of that with the second example. Okay. Is this argument generation or is it a Bing search? I think it's greedy, yeah. I think it's argumentics greedy, yeah. It's possible there was a Bing search, but I, yeah, I don't know. It kind of looks like it. It looks like greedy? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> it's like the temperature is not very high. Yijin is fluent. <laughs> right, <New Orleans. laughs> Um Huh, okay, then I'll be curious what you say later about the, the outputs that we see. Um, so uh, one thing that we noted is that since we have so many examples, um, we can mine them for particular kinds of paraphrase transformations. So for example, maybe one sentence is in past tense, one sentence is in present tense. We can feed in that information to the NMT system and then generate an output that looks uh, something like this. So this was work um, done with Mohit and um, Luke as well as John where we started to figure out what can we do with this data set and so this was some of the early work we were, we were trying to figure out if there's anything interesting here so uh, one thing we can do here is after finding the individual ones we can then combine them at test time so we have two different transformations question the statement and tends to past then we can generate a paraphrase like you were sorry to hurt me or with three transformations uh, we can uh, we didn't see this uh, tuple during training, but we can combine them at test time, and uh, and the model is able to figure out what the transformations mean, and then to uh, to combine them. And for short sentences, it tends to work pretty well. Um, didn't you kill Jimmy? Hmm. Don't you want it to be present? Yeah. Are you killing Jimmy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's just so unlikely that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe, or, or maybe it was thinking that kill is. Um, sort of present, uh, so maybe it got confused. Oh, well, there, there's already something present in there. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So it doesn't always work. Um, and I, I think another kind of concern here is that the more kind of, kinds of transformations that you use, the less likely it is to preserve meaning. Um, clearly, these have different meanings. Um, and so uh, we quickly moved on to transformations that hopefully should let us be more meaning preserving. So uh, this is work that uh, you may have um, seen presented here or may have talked to Mohit about. Um, I'll just go through this relatively briefly. But the idea is, well, we can just run a parser on one side of the sentence pair and then take the top two levels from the parse tree and feed that in as the transformation type. And if we do that with it wasn't a new idea, we get now this was not a new idea. So the adverbial phrase that we're forcing it to insert at the beginning, uh, it puts in the word now. Um, a few more examples for this isn't a new idea. Uh, if we just use a simple NPVP template, which actually matches the original sentence, we get something very similar to the input. If we put in the adverbial phrase in between the NP and VP, we get it just isn't a new idea. Um, if we try to generate a fragment that's just an adjective phrase, we get not so new. So it's able to figure out that that's uh, the adjective and generate something fluent. Um, yes? Just on Bing searches, how, do you do any evaluation of like how many of the Bing build requests are successful? Is it only the top one or is it like? 
Oh, I think, um, I think that's a pretty strong signal. I think the, so um, if you look at the Beam search for this third one, they're almost all gonna be just either new or not new or not so new, things like that. So it does tend to respect the parse template quite strongly. Um, so that's uh, something that's relatively easy to, to check in the output, and we found that that was happening um, the vast majority of times. It was getting close to that parse template. The more what the problem is is that it drops things that are important, it, it kind of uses things that are not important from the input, things like that. Actually, I have an example of that. So for these kind of short sentences, it tends to be very good, tends to respect the parse template quite well. Um, the problems come in, of course, when it drops key information. So this first example, okay, first the original. The modern day royals have nothing on these guys when it comes to scandals. So if the parse template has an S bar at the beginning, then it, it figures out that it has to move when it comes to scandals to the beginning and then keeps the rest of the sentence. But if you use a parse template with a prepositional phrase at the beginning, then it does find the right prepositional phrase on these guys, but then it has trouble generating the rest of the sentence as a paraphrase from the input. So it really should be, on these guys, modern royals have nothing when it comes to scandals. So for long sentences, we still have um, a lot of challenges here. Maybe better models, better training and tuning, we could actually um, fix some of these issues. Um, okay, but I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about how we've made use of these, the same data set of paraphrase pairs for um, transfer, which maybe style transfer is one example. Style is kind of a controversial term. And uh, I, so some people call it attribute transfer, or style transfer. I kind of think of it um, anytime you have maybe two corpora and you want to transfer uh, the characteristics from one corpus uh, to another, uh, these kinds of non-parallel transfer methods can, uh, uh, can be applied. So we started with the cross-aligned autoencoder from Shannadal from NIFS 2017. Uh, this, is, this is a nice, uh, simple model if you haven't seen it before. The idea is you have two data sets in different styles, x1 and x2. Um, so First you have an encoder, which reads in a sentence X, and, and you know what the style is of that sentence, so I'll call it Y1, and it outputs Z, which is a vector. And we hope that it represents the content of the sentence that is stripped, uh, has the, the style stripped away. Then there is a generator that reads in that content vector Z and the target style, call it Y2, and generates something X tilde, which is hopefully like X, but in style two. So this is their model, and then they, uh, they use a couple of different loss functions for training this model. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, for this one, could you do the same thing as the control car since it's written as a style as a parse tree? Um, yeah, so if you ran, say, a style classifier on the target. Yeah, so um, in, in our data set, it's very rare that the style changes. Uh, I think you would have to be, um, so it kind of depends what data set you want to use for training that style classifier. If you did something that was about um, kind of uh, sentence um, simplicity or length or kind of um, things like that, then I think you would be able to learn those kinds of transformations. But um, so they used uh, sentiment, which we'll talk about. We also did a, a modern to Dickens literature data set. Those kinds of things are gonna be hard to find in our data set because it's mostly very close paraphrase pairs that don't change the style. And actually, we're gonna use that insight okay. that they don't change the style, but yeah. I was more referring to, could you call the parts tree as style? Like the tree that you showed in the previous table. You know the tree for the input sentence and you know the tree for the target sentence. Right. So you mean we could use this model for the syntactic transformation? Ah, uh, yeah, I think, um, so there are some assumptions that are made about the content, although not too many, so, or sorry, about the style. Um, they basically just kind of condition these models on the styles, and so you can represent that any way you want, including as a, um, I guess you could run a separate encoder on the parse tree and then kind of do a tension over that to kind of represent why here. So yeah, I think that probably could be done in this framework. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. Well, how are you representing style? Is it just like an inside of a sentence? Um, ah, so we are representing style in these two cases just as a binary variable. 
So we just have two styles, and we actually have a vector in some uh, real space, maybe 200 dimensional, but there are just two of those vectors, one for each style. Yeah, so we, um, yeah, so for the case of maybe simplification or uh, formality, things like that, that would, that would fit into this framework. So uh, the loss functions that they use for training, um, first I'll mention the reconstruction loss. So uh, this just gets the encoder and generator to model natural language. So if you encode a sentence x1 with style y1 and then generate from it with the same style, you should get back the original sentence. And they have these losses for both style one and style two. Yes, yeah, so the data setup is that you know what style every sentence is. Oh, sure. And yeah. Styles. Yes. How did you assign those styles? So for um, sentiment, uh, this paper and uh, what we're doing, we just uh, use the star ratings and say these are positive, these are negative. Oh. Yeah. And then for the literature data set, these are, these are sentences from Charles Dickens, these are from the Toronto Books Corpus. Yeah. yeah. But if you didn't have labels, um, then but you believed in a, a label data set, uh, you could train a classifier on that and then just label all the sentences that you want. Um, so what actually makes their model work is that they use some adversarial losses, uh, discriminators that try to differentiate the hidden vectors from real versus transferred sentences. Uh, I don't have time to go into it in much detail. Um, it's not uh, super crucial to understanding um, our contribution. So I, uh, I will defer you to the, uh, their, their paper for details on that. So uh, their reconstruction losses give the framework one kind of, or one way to preserve content and style, I would claim, by just reproducing the same sentence. That's how you uh, keep the same content and style. So what we're gonna be doing, we add a loss based on pairs from the para NMT data set that shows the framework other ways to generate different words that still have the same content and style. So the loss looks just like the reconstruction loss except now our pairs are UV rather than X1, X1. So we're going to assume that the pairs in our data set have the same style. Uh, we also, so this seems to help a little bit we also found a lot of benefit by adding in extra losses to encourage uh, a notion of cyclic uh, consistency. So these things have started to catch on in the un uh, unsupervised neural MT literature and other kind of textual transfer tasks. When you transfer style one to style two, you wanna be able to go back from two to one. And this seems to help a lot also. I don't uh, have any more slides on that, but uh, for the results that I'll show you, we combined all these losses together and added them to the Shen et al. model. Okay, so some examples. Uh, the baseline here is the Shen et al. output that we, we ran their code, and the, uh, the final row, our model, has our extra losses. So first, for going from negative to positive, um, for simple cases like this, like the food tasted awful, it's pretty easy to do this and to preserve uh, the non-sentiment um, related content. Let's look at a more interesting example. So the original is last night, however, is way too thick and tasteless with the typo. Um, and the, it's kind of interesting how the baseline changed it. So it changed last night to first time here. Um, and then added in positive sentiment words at the end. And so I think it did sort of uh, succeed in style transfer in that a sentiment analyzer would label the baseline output as positive, um, but it did lose some of the content. Uh, whereas our output is also positive, but uh, figures out what to change and what to uh, leave there. Another example uh, from positive to negative, um, we love everything from here, it changes to we hate everything from here. Um, been coming here for years, everyone is always nice and friendly. Become, it's been coming here for years, everyone is rude and rude. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of funny, there are some logical um, questions I would have for the author of this, namely, why, why do you keep coming, right? <laughs> uh, if everyone's rude, or it, if you hate everything, if you hate half the things, why do you order the other half? You know, why do you keep keep ordering things if you hate everything so far. Um, but yeah, so we're not quite there yet. Like the food is terrible and the portions are so small. 
<laughs> right. Which probably does, you know, things like that probably do exist in the data. So maybe the model is doing something cleverer than I, than I think. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we still have problems with certain content words. So we're, we figured out that we should change definitely recommend to will not recommend or go back, but changes Phoenix to Vegas. Maybe those are close in the embedding space. I'm actually not, uh, haven't checked that one, but um, still have, have struggled. Or I actually could be Vegas is more likely to appear in negative reviews and Phoenix is more likely to appear in positive. I haven't checked the frequency counts on those. What is the baseline? That is the Shannadal, yeah. Yeah, so, um, right. So uh, one thing we found is that it, what matters a lot is when you stop training. So early on, um, all these models just sort of uh, totally forget the input and just, just generate positive or negative sentiment words. Uh, and then later on, they get to the point where they just totally reproduce the input. Um, and so it's important to stop training at the right point to get something that is both transferring style but still roughly reflecting the semantic content. So we. We did model selection for both the baseline and our model by sort of optimizing this metric we define, which is the sum of three different metrics based on post-transfer style classification accuracy, uh, semantic similarity to the input, and fluency. Um, so if you look at different points in the trajectory, so we kind of looked at the whole trajectory, and um, yeah, this, this was sort of the best kind of uh, setting um, under our metric, but one challenge is to yeah, define automatic metrics for these tasks. But I, th I think especially uh, the cyclic loss helps to preserve content words because there's no way that you can get back to the original input if you don't uh, roughly have most of the words in there. Um, so just some quick examples with our other data set. So since the sentiment transfer data set is, um, let's see, I think it's a good starting point, but I think it's too easy. Um, I think there are a lot of other really interesting style transfer settings that we should consider and, and start working with. Uh, I think this one, on the other hand, is maybe a little bit too hard. This was our effort. Um, so we collected data from Charles Dickens from the Toronto Books Corpus. And if you look at examples that are focused mainly on uh, frequent words, not too many names, then you, you do see some interesting outputs, uh, although there, there is some drift in, in meaning, so especially with this third one, what's the consequence becomes and what's the matter, and those, I would say, probably, uh, it depends on the context, but they probably have different meanings. And when you look at examples that have names or content words, then it, it struggles to figure out um, how, if anything, to change them, um, how to refer to them. So these are some, some examples where the sentence structure is mostly matching, but, but the meaning ends up being changed too drastically, I would, um, I would say. Okay, so that's all I really wanted to say about paraphrase modeling and control generation. Uh, I kind of had a couple words since I'm here at AI2. Um, I had a couple slides on really what I want to do next. So, um, and then we'll, I think, still have time for, for Q&A at the end. So my goal is to understand text in the way a human does with systems. And clearly, I think we need to move beyond the sentence level. Sentences work fine for some things. It's very natural to use sentences. But clearly, that's not how we write text. There's always a lot of context, whether it's written down or not. And uh, a data set I worked on a few years ago, MC Test, uh, has kind of, uh, there's not been as much work on it these days. It's, it's very small, um, but I think, it's, I think it's a really interesting data set that has a lot, of, uh, a lot of really fundamental challenges for natural language understanding that we haven't solved yet. So there's simple stories, this one about a boy named Fritz, and then multiple choice questions with uh, free response answers. Um, and so there's, there's always just one answer that is correct in these questions. And so it's a, to think about the kinds of things that we actually have to model to get these answers right that we're simply not modeling um, is, is uh, kind of uh, surprising to me. Um, it seems like uh, most of the stuff happening in this story is really inter-sentence uh, kind of uh, relationships. And so what I want to do is work on going beyond sentences and uh, model the world of a piece of narrative text. Um, I think I've been reading a lot of uh, 
psychology and cognitive science literature, and there, there seems to be this interesting uh, confluence between narrative understanding and how infants uh, learn to perceive the, the world around them. So the kind of primacy of agents with their goals, their beliefs, their intentions, and a notion of theory of mind with both, which both infants um, of a certain age as well as people use when they're understanding narratives. Uh, these seem to be uh, really key to natural language understanding. And other things like the, the difference between agents and objects, uh, things like place and uh, temporality, uh, causality. Uh, I, I would feel comfortable hard coding in some of these kinds of data structures into our representations uh, for natural language understanding of, of narrative text. Um, it's certainly fun to read the literature and think about how would I design a set of latent variables or a neural architecture to encode theory of mind, say, of the agents that are participating in the narrative. And um, this, I think it really gets much more into um, AI and other application areas of AI, like uh, I, I think vision is trying to solve many of the same problems we are. Um, I, would, I would like to think of having a, possibly a distinct world model that can uh, progress on its own and then periodically can generate some text or generate some, some images or some sounds. Um, I think that uh, uh, all of these problems are, are linked and we could maybe think about uh, having a separate abstraction of world modeling that can then be plugged into our models for visual and for natural language understanding. Um, and we should probably try to team up with as many people as we can to uh, solve this because it seems very challenging. Um, and I think uh, uh, I, I like to read fiction and sometimes it really slows me down because I, I stop and think, how do I know this? Uh, how do I know who this pronoun is referencing? And oftentimes it, um, it's something that takes maybe several paragraphs, maybe it goes back to the, the whole start of the book. Uh, sometimes it, it doesn't matter. Sometimes the author leaves out who is saying a particular quotation because there's just a mob of people that it's not important to uh, differentiate among. And uh, I think that um, especially in narrative text, uh, I think we should start with maybe children's stories because a lot more of that is kind of given, um, but to move on to fiction uh, more, more generally, it seems like the world modeling part is more and more important. And of course, there's still a lot of language modeling in terms of uh, figuring out when the world or what parts of the world should be rendered in text? What, when is it time to generate a piece of text from this evolving world? Um, notions about uh, pragmatics and reporting bias are really kind of key, key challenges here. Um, but yeah, the more I, I kind of try to solve the natural language understanding problem, the more I find myself going in this direction. So yeah, I'm excited to talk about, or to talk to, to many of you about this, because I'm sure you've been thinking about it for years. Uh, and I've just been thinking about it for a few months. But that is all I wanted to say, so thanks. <laughs>